This is a Red Widow, the extremely rare, highly venomous cousin of the Black Widow, and this forest is absolutely full of them. If you fear spiders, you know the Black Widow, and that's why a forest full of widows probably sounds like a living nightmare. This is the United States' most infamous arachnid for a reason. The bite of a black widow causes excruciating pain, muscle and nerve damage, and can even kill you. So why have you never heard of their rare red cousin? That is because the red widow is one of the most elusive spiders in the world. Only found in a tiny part of central and southern Florida in remnant stands of white sand scrub a strange habitat that is rarely explored by humans. Most people who do know this spider fear it because of reports that their bites can leave you with chronic pain for the rest of your life. But there's another part of their story that absolutely terrifies us, and it's not the bite. Today, we're setting out to find America's rarest widow and show you what about them you should really fear. My name is Harrison, and this is Evan. We're twin brothers on a mission to share the real stories of our planet's wildlife while we still can. And that could not be more important to do with the Red Widow, because their time might be running out. This spider is at the center of a much bigger story about how we think about our U.S. public lands. And ever since we found our lifers last year, we've been spending as much time in this bizarre, amazing forest as we can, obsessed with telling it properly. When you enter this place, one thing is clear. Red Widows may be extremely rare overall, but in the pockets where they do exist, their numbers are insane. And today, after only a few minutes of poking around, I spotted a massive female tucked away in her web and coaxed her out to make the catch. There she is. Look at the size of her! Got her. There she is. That spider is the one we have come to Florida to find. This is the Red Widow, a spider whose story we've wanted to tell for a very long time. But we have to start here. Anytime we cover widows, really any kind of spider, the first question people have is, is it dangerous? Is the Red Widow as scary as the infamous Black Widow? Well, there's only one way to find out. I'm gonna take her out here. Oh, she's right on the lid, look at that. And it's time to find out if the Red Widow is anything to fear. There she is. And I would say, you just about have your answer right there. But you can't get complacent with a Red Widow because their venom is very serious. These spiders have an incredibly potent neurotoxic venom that's actually as strong as the venom of a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. So this is not stuff you can mess with by any means. But even though their venom is quite strong, they don't have very much of it at all. Exactly. In fact, the amount of venom that a Western Diamondback would inject in a bite weighs more than this spider's entire body. Just to put into perspective how little venom she has, a typical Red Widow will have less than two-tenths of a gram of venom. There is actually so little venom in her body that she does not have enough of it to physically kill an adult human. So that is one thing to put your mind at ease. This is not a life-threatening spider. But even if it won't kill you, this is not a bite you'd want to take. The Red Widow's neurotoxic venom sends your nervous system into overdrive, causing the intense pain, swelling, and muscle spasms that widow bites are infamous for. Now, Black Widows still have the edge as far as toxicity, but the way Red Widow venom works is arguably even scarier. It binds so tightly to the neurons it attacks that it can affect them for days or weeks on end. And some reports even claim that the symptoms can last for the rest of the victim's life. The threat of lifelong pain sounds like a good way to avoid getting eaten, but the thing is, their venom doesn't kick in immediately. So if a predator is close enough for the Red Widow to land a bite, it's probably already too late. But these spiders are far from defenseless. Their bright red color is actually a form of protection in itself, since it acts as a visual warning to tell predators that they're super toxic and not worth messing with. No, and to be honest, 
taking a bite from one of these spiders is almost impossible because of where they're living. These are not like brown or black widows that are living regularly in human structures. Red widows only live out here in these well-preserved scrub habitats, so this is not something you're coming across in your garage or your basement or your shed or anything like that. You really have to come to these habitats in order to see these spiders. And if you're not literally pulling them out of their webs and handling them like we are, the chances of taking a bite are essentially zero. But the thing about their venom is that they're not using it for us. It's not for defense. It's the main tool they're using to subdue their prey, not to mention to actually digest it. So this is a critical tool that these spiders cannot survive without, which is why they don't want to waste it on something like us that's far too big for them to eat. Like any spider, these are a predatory species eating other animals, and their venom is so effective that they have become one of the most dominant invertebrate predators in the entire scrub ecosystem. And this habitat we're in right now is actually one of the strongholds of this species. And to understand how these spiders have become so successful, we need to take a closer look at this habitat and what they're doing to survive here. The white sand scrub looks lifeless at first glance, but when you take a closer look, you'll notice that there are webs everywhere. Just the hike to our filming spot yielded over a dozen widow webs of the potential hundreds that are here, but they're not the only ones lurking in the tangled undergrowth. The more you explore the scrub, the more bizarre, otherworldly creatures start to reveal themselves, and most of them can't be found anywhere else on Earth. Strange lizards swim through the sand, Masterfully camouflaged insects stake out every plant, and some of America's biggest wolf spiders patrol the forest floor in search of their next meal. We're barely scratching the surface of the diversity here, but the real question is, why are there so many endemic animals concentrated in the scrub? There's a clue in the soil itself, pristine white sand. For hundreds of thousands of years, Florida wasn't a peninsula. It was a chain of white sand islands, where the ancestors of the Red Widow and all the other endemic scrub oddities evolved in total isolation from mainland wildlife. With limited space, a hot, unforgiving climate, and little food or water available, competition for the scrub island's few resources was fierce, and those conditions have persisted to this day, pushing evolution to its limits. The residents who survived this challenge did it by honing better ways to move, hide, and of course, hunt. The thing red widows excel at, thanks to the main tool of their trade, their web. The Red Widow's web looks kind of messy and random at first glance, but this is actually a perfectly designed insect trap. They often will build their webs between different plants. We have these two saw palmettos here, and you'll notice that the web stretches through this whole open space as well. This is what we call a fly-through zone, which is an area of the habitat that lots of flying insects will use to navigate the scrub a little bit easier. They're looking for the path of least resistance so they can get around the complex tangle of leaves leaves in these plants, but the Red Widow is capitalizing on that and waiting for them to fly right through this perfect open space, which is where they'll get caught up in that incredibly sticky web. With a hunting strategy this refined, life in the scrub is almost like a buffet for the Red Widow, because this place is absolutely crawling with insects, and they do not discriminate about what's on the menu. There are beetles of every shape and size, a grasshopper or katydid blending into any background you look at, and hordes of dragonflies, wasps, and innumerable other flying insects here, and they're all fair game. This girl will take down anything that falls into her web, but deadly venom only works if she can actually inject it. These webs are incredibly strong. They're capable of holding down insects that are way bigger than the widow itself. Things like some of the grasshopper and dragonfly species out here absolutely dwarf the widows, and they can still make a meal out of it using this incredible web. And this is not just a passive trap. The widow is sitting deep down in the funnel at the base of one of these palmetto leaves, waiting for an insect to get caught in the web and start to struggle. That will send vibrations all through the web right down to where the widow is sitting, and she can tell exactly where that insect is, and even how big it is based on the strength of the vibrations. So in that way, the web acts as an extension of the widow's senses. She's literally able to feel everything that's going on between these two plants to know if she's captured a meal. 
Now right next to me is the reason that red widows are so abundant in this forest. This right here is a saw palmetto, and this is the plant that the vast majority of red widow spiders built their webs on. Over 95% of red widow webs are found on saw palmettos, and if they're not on these plants, they're probably built on small scrub oak trees like the myrtle oaks behind me. You can get scrub oaks, sand live oaks, things like that, and these are the only plants on earth that red widows will build their webs on. Now you look at this plant and it doesn't look very impressive. It's not tall, but this is a fully grown mature tree. They don't get huge, but they take an incredibly long time to grow. Myrtle oaks can live for 100 to 300 years. Saw palmettos can live for 500 to 700 years. And it takes each of them several hundred years just to reach maturity. And red widows only build their webs on mature palmettos and other trees. Because they're the right height off the ground, they have the right structure of branches and leaves to keep their webs safe, they cannot live on anything else. And that is where this story gets scary. Because it takes so many years for these habitats to develop, if we were to lose the scrub that exists now, it is physically impossible for it to regenerate in our lifetime, even several human lifetimes. It could take 300 years for this habitat to come back if we lost it. Longer than the United States has been a country. This means that by definition, the white sand scrub is an old growth forest a special class of habitat that we only get one chance to protect. We need to preserve what we already have in order to keep it alive. The thing is, Florida scrub is a wildly overlooked ecosystem. Most people have no idea it exists or how many irreplaceable species are living here, even if they vacation or live right near it, which means most of it goes without real protection. However, because they're such a habitat specialist, where you see healthy red widow populations, they're an indicator that proves that their home is a genuine old growth stand, and we need to be able to recognize and preserve these areas, because there is no shortage of threats looming over the scrub that could wipe out the entire thing. All right, so we are fortunate to be here with something of an expert of the Florida scrub habitat. This is Mikey Green, and you've been coming to areas like this for a very long time, right? Yes, I come here all the time. I used to even come out here almost daily when I had the chance to. Right, so you're a very good person to talk about this. The Florida scrub is an incredibly threatened ecosystem, and there are lots of reasons for that. In your experience, you've seen some of the changes that have happened in this region and in other areas. Why are Florida scrubs so heavily threatened? Yeah, so actually the biggest reason why Florida scrub is such a heavily threatened ecosystem is human development. The Florida scrub is, I mean, at first glance, an optimal place to build buildings, golf courses, so many other human amenities. Exactly. The habitat is very flat and open, so it's easier to develop, and oftentimes the scrub exists right on the coast, which is a very desirable part of the land, and because of the composition of the habitat, it doesn't flood very easily, and that is quite a commodity in Florida where the water table can be quite high. So for developers, this land can be quite valuable. And this development is happening fast. Most of the destruction of Florida scrub habitat happened in the 20th century, particularly as urban expansion and coastal development became higher priorities in Florida after the post-World War II population boom. Sprawling cities and endless fields of agriculture replaced the scrub so quickly that we don't even know how much of this habitat was here historically, because we really didn't start keeping track until most of it was already gone. Conservative estimates suggest there would have been over a million hectares of scrub across Florida, but by the end of the 20th century, over 90% of this habitat was lost statewide. Today, around 162,000 hectares of scrub are left, just 1.2% of Florida's total land area, making it the most endangered habitat in the state. But even now, the threats to the scrub aren't slowing down. Over three quarters of the remaining habitat is on public land, which means it has almost no protections against development. So the fate of the Florida scrub is still extremely uncertain. And even well before this human development, the Florida scrub was already quite a fragmented ecosystem, which means small little bits and pieces were scattered throughout the state of Florida. However, now after a lot of this area has unfortunately been developed, there's even more fragmentation than there was before, which is absolutely horrible for the animals and plants that live in this ecosystem. 
Exactly. As the habitat continues to shrink and human development continues to expand, there are fewer resources available for the wildlife that does live here. And very importantly, the plants that all of the animals here rely on are some of the first things to go when development starts. So once you lose these critical food and habitat resources, the entire ecosystem starts to collapse. But as you look out at the habitat, it doesn't really look like much. If you're not familiar with what's living here, it kind of seems like there's no value to this habitat at all, but that couldn't be further from the truth. The scrub is actually one of Florida's most important ecosystems, because it has served as a natural barrier against environmental threats for hundreds of thousands of years. The scrub's dry, sandy substrate can basically soak up as much water as you throw at it, which makes it particularly effective at stopping the spread and damage of floods. The loose soil that much of Florida is built on is also very vulnerable to erosion, but the specialized community of plants here helps to hold the sand together, locking the habitat in place with their robust root systems. But after years of fragmentation, the scrub has effectively become islands again, tiny patches of good habitat in a sea of human construction. The ecosystem is now so disconnected that in many places it can't provide the same services it once did. Leaving a few fragments of scrub here and there just doesn't come close to equaling the impact that one contiguous habitat would have had. But we can't give up on the scrub that's still left, because conserving this habitat is the only way to preserve the irreplaceable benefits it provides for humans and wildlife alike. Luckily, there are a lot of projects ongoing right now to protect the Florida scrub, and there are things that literally every person out there watching can do to help keep this ecosystem safe into the future. And the biggest of those by far is to be vocal and active in the movements to protect this habitat politically, because a lot of the attacks on this ecosystem are starting in the government. Now more than ever before, United States public lands are under attack as the government moves to sell this land to the highest bidder. And what you can do is when there are public comment periods, when there is the opportunity for people to speak out, make your voice a part of that. Yes, please, I cannot stress that enough. It might not seem like your voice might have that big of an impact when it comes to decisions made by the government, but trust me, believe me, it does. Just last year, a state park of this white sand Florida scrub habitat, which you'd think would be heavily protected, was under threat of being developed for making golf courses. That just sounds absurd, but the plan was honestly looking like it was going to happen but the whole South Florida community came together and made our voices heard, and they knew they had to step back. This is only just one occurrence, unfortunately. This happens everywhere in scrub and scrub adjacent habitats all throughout the state of Florida. It's a battle that, while unfortunately seems to never end, the situation last year where Jonathan Dickinson State Park stayed protected gives me hope and optimism about the future of this wonderful Florida scrub habitat behind us because clearly our South Florida community cares way too much about it to let it go. Absolutely, and there's so much to care about, and that's one of the other things that anyone can do if you have the opportunity to explore this ecosystem, document it, take pictures of what you see, share those online. That's what we're doing today is life listing to see exactly what animals are living here, how they're surviving in this ecosystem, and what they need to be able to continue. Because the better we understand all of the different ways animals out here are making their living, the better we can protect the ecosystem overall. I've always been excited to see Red Widows because I think they're unique and fascinating spiders. But when I see one now, it's exciting for another reason. If you can find Red Widows, it proves that you're in a truly special habitat that we've done a good job at preserving. So sharing space with one of these spiders is something to be really proud of. The story of the Red Widow is a reminder that there's inherent value in protecting public land. The Florida scrub still has tons of ecological secrets that we have yet to unlock, and there's no way of knowing how our next discovery might help people until we make it, which is why it's so important to protect places like this while we still can. If we get this right, both humans and wildlife will be much better for it, and it's up to all of us to make that happen. We can clearly learn a ton by studying spiders like the Red Widow. And in the deserts of Chile, there's one species that might provide the answer to a huge challenge.
research how to coexist with one of the deadliest spiders on Earth. To see our mission to film the little-known Vicente's recluse for the first time ever, check out this video. And with that, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next one.